Mark chapter number 5. I'm not real sure why, but I want to read just verse number 36 tonight. And I'm not real sure what I'll do. I got a whole outline, but if I don't get to it, that's okay. But Mark chapter number 5, verse number 36. We'll focus on the last phrase, but as soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he saith to the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. I want to read just that last phrase again. Be not afraid, only believe. Believe. I meant to look it up, and, and I'm, I'm sorry I didn't, but Jesus spoke to another man in the Gospels, and he said, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. Anybody ever prayed something like that? Amen. We know what we're supposed to believe, and we know... Do y'all remember how good God was yesterday? Anybody remember how good God was yesterday? Well, Satan would have us blinded to the fact that God's good tomorrow. Did you hear what I said? God is good tomorrow. It's not that He will be. He is He is good. You can mark it down. You can take it to the bank. He is good tomorrow. And, and, and not, only, not only is He good tomorrow, but wherever your tomorrow is... Whether it's on earth or whether it's in heaven, God is good. Amen. Amen. I, 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 I tell you, he says here to a man that just heard that his daughter had died, and Jesus' response to that. He told him some other things, but his response was, Be not afraid, only believe. And so if you tell someone to not be afraid, then there is an understanding that they are afraid, and that they are fearful. We mentioned just a couple services ago, I'm not exactly sure when it was, but we got to talking about that storm and or that trouble, or whatever it may be that maybe has scared our child, and we've saved them from that, whether it be a storm, or uh, maybe a scary monster under the bed, or whatever it may be, you've saved them from it, but you still, even though they're saved from it, you have to remind them that they are also safe. They're... (laughs) They're in mama's arms or they're in daddy's arms. And so even though they're, they're protected, you have to remind them that they don't have to be afraid because I have you in my arms. And I almost feel as though Jesus on this, on this road here, he's dealing with multiple things. He's dealing with the maniac of Gadara. He starts dealing with this, um, uh, this ruler of the synagogue, and then in the middle of trying to help him, there's a woman that presses through the crowd and messes up the, the ruler's plans. And right in the middle of all of that, he heals this woman, and then he gets news that this ruler's daughter had died. And his response was, don't be afraid, just believe. And so if I could tell you tonight, don't be afraid, just believe. Now, the t- if I'm going to preach, and I still don't know what I'm going to do. I did before David started messing around. If I am going to preach, it's going to be titled Faith Versus Fear or Faith Over Fear. I don't know about you. I realize that this is a very sensitive subject to Sister Irene and Brother Deacon, and, and I, don't, I don't mean anything but... I would suspect anybody of any age getting a call that your child has died would be detrimental. I can't even imagine. But then to hear Jesus say, 
Be not afraid. Only believe. That would be hard to hear. It'd be hard to hear. And then it would be hard to put one foot in front of the other. To go to that place where you know your daughter is dead. And you're taking the master with you. But he said, be not afraid. He said, just believe. You know what you're supposed to do. But it's hard. But I'm glad that the story doesn't end with verse number 36. Over, If you got a Schofield Bible, you just turn your page. But over in verse number 41, (laughs) he got to the house and he took the damsel by the hand and said, Talitha Kuma, which is being interpreted damsel, I say unto thee, arise. And straightway the damsel arose and walked. (laughs) I have always, and I'm not going to say much more than this about this, but I've always wondered why there's a little girl that's 12 years old and there's a woman that had an issue of blood for 12 years. Brother Dwayne Moore and I have a theory. I think we're both wrong, but we still have a theory. Faith over fear. We truly, in November of 2021, we and preachers have been saying this phrase for years, the day and age we live in. But quite honestly, what is today, the what is it, the 17th or 18th, something along that line. November 17th, 2021. Fear is being fed to every man, woman, boy, and girl in this world. Whether it's politics or whether it's a pandemic. Whether it's the news media or it's the school system. Fear, fear, fear. But I want us to know something. According to Mark chapter number 5, there are at least three people that had fear, but by faith, they were able to overcome it. We, We fear a lot of things. We fear, let's just be honest, we fear this sickness. Many of us, if not all of us, have had this thing. We, we fear getting it again. We fear spreading it. We feel it continuing. We, we, we fear it continuing. We fear a lot of things. There's some in our church or some that are acquainted with our church that are having to make a decision whether or not to get a vaccine or lose their job. They're fearful. You've got husbands and wives that are considering start a family, but they're fearful because do they really want to raise a child in this hour? We could go on and on and on about things that we fear, but I need you to understand no matter what it is, We spoke just a couple months back about the sovereignty of God. Know that God is in control. And God knows what He's doing. If I can, I want to try to very quickly, very quickly preach these three things. Faith over fear. Number one, I want us to see this devil-driven man of Gadara. I'm not going to read throughout verse number 1 through verse number 20, but that encapsulates everything that we'll talk about. But in verse number 1 down through verse number 5, you see that he was controlled by the devil. Jesus came in verse number 1. 
Uh, he came out of the ship and, and he didn't seek, this, this is what has always blown my mind. He didn't seek out this man with the devils or with the demons, but rather they sought him out. And I may mention this again, but in James chapter number two, verse number 19, it says that the devils also believe and tremble. And so it made me wonder maybe if, if as soon as Jesus' feet touched that land that the devils knew that something was about to happen. It says there in verse number uh, 2 that immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. You know the story. You've heard it all your life. He was in the tombs. He dwelt there. He cut himself with stones. He cried. He was bound, but he broke the chains. He broke all the fetters. The people were fearful. Uh, night and day, the Bible says that he was uh, in the mountains and in the tombs crying and cutting himself. But when he saw Jesus, verse number 6, afar off, he ran and worshipped him. Now that seems a little off to me. We see a man that is controlled by this devil and we see, we would call it maybe schizophrenia or, or multiple personality disorders or what have you, but that, that's what people would call it today. But the, I believe the Bible is very specific. This boy had a devil. Matter of fact, he goes on, he says he was legion and because we are many. And so I believe he had many devils in him. Uh, but we, we find that he was uh, controlled in every facet. He was self-mutilating uh, himself. He was cutting himself. He was possessed. He was under the absolute control of these demons. Now, could you imagine, we talked about faith and fear. Could you imagine the type of fear uh, that must have been in this man. Now, I, I just said that he was being controlled by these demons or by these devils. And I, I believe that. And I believe that he was he was under the control with whether he, where he went, what he said, what he did, how he harmed himself. And could you imagine, it, just for a moment, being yourself, but someone else making you move, making you put one foot in front of the other. Someone else controlling your thoughts. Someone else controlling uh, you cutting your own self, hurting yourself, staying in a graveyard every single night. And I could just imagine the fear that must have enveloped this man. And the Bible says that, that this man that was possessed with the devil, that had an unclean spirit, he came and fell down in front of Jesus and worship. That seems odd to me. We go back to James chapter number 2, verse number 19, that the devils also believe and tremble. I was reading this, this book, and, and it was actually a, a man by the name of Austin Klein. He was, he's, he's, he's agnostic, and he, he tried to counter, counteract everything about the Bible. But he says, he said this, who was worshiping Jesus? The man? Or the demons. He went on to say, the latter makes no sense, but if it's the man, then he hasn't lost all control over his actions. This man is known for educating people about atheism, agnosticism. But I believe that he was right. I believe he was right on both counts. So listen to what he says again. He says, was it the man worshiping or the demons? The latter makes no sense, but if it is the man, he hasn't lost all control. I say that he's right on both counts because it makes no sense that the devils would worship Christ. They are the ones that were cast into hell. They are the ones that, that rebelled against all of heaven. They are the ones that, that still rebel today and are trying their best to tear down everything that Christ has done. But the devils, listen to me, know who Jesus is. And they know no matter how hard they try, He is still God's only Son. Amen? And so they, I firmly believe that they are worshiping Jesus Christ here because they know who He is. But 
the man also, I believe, he has some control over his actions in, 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 in as much that he knows that he needs help. He knows that he wants help. And this is the only man that can do it. Now, I say this is the only man that can do it because you remember the Scripture says that he had been bound... The Scripture says that this has been going on for some time. He had been dwelling in the tombs. You don't just camp overnight and get the the terminology dwelling. This word dwell, it means to abide continually. And so he was living in the tombs. Every night he was crying and cutting himself. The Bible says that he had been often bound with fetters and chains. The chains had been plucked asunder and the fetters broken in pieces. Neither could any any man tame him. So all of a sudden, from out of nowhere, a boat comes up on the shore of Gadara, and these devils that are oppressing this man fall down at his feet and begin to worship, and this man sees a way out. This man says he's never done this to any of these other people that have bound him. This man, these demons have never bowed at anyone else's feet. This demon has never tried to worship any of these other people that have put chains and fetters on him. Something's different about, I'm about to run out that front door. Something's different about this man named Jesus. And I believe with every fiber of his being, he had to come out of himself in order to ask for help himself. This to this. He says he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. I believe this is that legion we find in verse number 9. For he says for we are many. Now there were nigh to the mountains a great herd of swine. All the devils besought him and sent us into the swine. And uh, verse number 13, forthwith Jesus gave them leave. The unclean spirits went out. The uh, the pigs went out in a steep place. Verse number 14. And they that fed the swine, they, they saw it. They told the city. They told the country and they went out to see what was done. Verse number 15, when they come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting clothed and in his right mind and they were afraid. I believe some words may have taken place, some, some action may have taken place in this man's, I believe that he realized that there was something different about this man, Jesus. And not only did the devils worship him because they believe and tremble, but I believe this man also believed and trembled because he found a difference in this man. He found something that the devils were afraid of. Whether he said the words or not, I believe in his heart there was something that cried out to God. Now you and I know there are some times that we can't pray. There are some times that we are paying too much to pray. There are some times that we're too scared or too burdened or too bothered to to pray. (laughs) But I'm glad that God knows our heart. We find here this man, Mr. Klein, Mr. Klein said that he, he, he didn't, he didn't make no sense for those devils to worship him. Mr. Klein said that it, 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 it would have to prove that there was something about this man. He hadn't lost all of his faculties. Well, I believe if he had ever truly experienced Christ, which apparently he hadn't, because he had been teaching all these other things, if he had had an experience with Christ, if he had ever experienced that love of God uh, coming into his heart, if he had ever experienced forgiveness, if he had ever experienced the grace and the mercy of God being applied to our hearts, he would understand that, yes, there is something worthy about this man, Jesus, whether it be a man or whether it be a devil, to worship. We see that This man, he was confronted by Christ. We see that he was cleansed by Christ. If you look at verse 11 down through 14, you see that the the devils, they were cast away. But then he was commissioned by Christ. Verse number 15 down through maybe verse number 20 or so. It says that those people that came in verse number 15... It says they began, in verse 17, they began to pray to part out of the coast. But verse number 18, when he was come into the ship, when Jesus was coming into the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil 
prayed him that he might be with him. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not. He didn't allow him to do it, but said, Go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee and hath had compassion on thee. And he departed, began to publish in Decapolis how, uh, uh, how great things Jesus had done for him and all men did marvel. We see that he was controlled by the devil. He was confronted by Christ. He was cleansed by Christ. But he was commissioned by Christ. He was free. He had something to say. Brother Jeb talked on Sunday morning, preached Sunday morning, about us having a story to tell. About us having a testimony to tell. We made mention of that after he got done, maybe even Sunday night. But I want to remind us tonight that we have something to tell. If we have been for Jesus said, whom the Son hath set free, he shall be free indeed. That word indeed means as if he had never been bound. And here, all of a sudden, this man is no longer cutting himself. He's no longer naked, but he's clothed. He's sitting in his right mind at the feet of Jesus. Jesus gets up, goes on the boat. The boy gets, or the man, whatever it is, gets up, gets on the boat and says, I want to go with you. Jesus said, no, but you stay here. You tell everybody what great things have been done. What did he do? He went and told them, listen to the last phrase, how great things Jesus had done For him. He told what happened to him. I've told you before. I got saved under the preaching of Brother Phil Kidd. You could take him or leave him now. It don't don't matter to me. But I've heard Brother Kidd's testimony over and over again. And I could probably tell you it myself. That's not my testimony, Brother David. And I can tell you my testimony. And you have heard it. And you might be able to tell my testimony, but it's not yours. This man went and told everybody what God had done for him. You see, there's a difference in verse number 13, 14 or so. Remember those that fed the swine? They saw what had happened. And they went and told everybody. But it wasn't, it wasn't him that had the devil. I go, I go back to the song all the time, The Alabaster Box. Whoever wrote that song, I, look, I'm telling you, whoever wrote that song, yeah. The writer said, you weren't there the night he found me. You don't know the cost of oil in my alabaster box. As many times I've told my story, there are still things that you don't know. And you don't need to know. That's some oil in my ala- <laughs> That's some oil in my alabaster box that's just for me and God to know about. Amen. I got I got to hurry. Number two, there was a determined woman with an issue. Verse number 25 and 27, we see, you get down to verse 27, you see that she heard about Jesus. Let's just skip down to there. When she had heard of Jesus, she came in the press behind and touched his garment. I need to re- I need to read these next two verses. For she said, "If I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole." And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. Now, look, I can show you my Bible, and you can see that it's written there, and it's written in my hand. I don't know where it came from, but I was sitting at the table today and just blessed my own self. I want you to look at with with me verse number 27. When she had heard of Jesus. I want you to underline the word heard. And then out on your margin I want you to write facts. F-A-C-T-S. Now if if it was any of y'all that gave me this. Just let me have my moment. 
Verse number 28, for she said, If I may touch but his clothes, I shall behold. Underword that word, underline that word shall and write faith. And then, verse 29, And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. Here's that word feeling. Facts, faith, and feeling. We go back to Romans chapter number 10. Scripture said, Whosoever shall call upon my name, upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. There's the facts. Here's what's going to happen. But, how shall they call upon Him of whom they have not heard? How shall they hear? How shall they preach except they be sent? So now you have facts. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But then you've got what's next? Faith. There's that word shall again. You will be. But it's not until they hear it. It's not until they hear this word. It's not until they hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where that faith comes in. But I'm glad, even, even way back in John 3.16, He gives us a concrete word, shall. There's that faith again. And then the feelings. People say, I'm not saved on feelings. And I'm glad I'm not. There have been a lot of times, don't misunderstand me, but there's been a lot of times I didn't feel saved. Didn't feel like praying. Didn't feel like reading my Bible or going to church. But I'm glad I have something that I can feel on the inside. She had heard about Jesus in verse 27. She hurried to find Him. And notice it says that she came behind Him in the press and touched His garment. She said, but if I can touch His clothes, I shall be whole. And again, I, I could just imagine what's going through her mind. She's been dealing with this, what we may call hemorrhaging for 12 years now. She's been declared unclean. She shouldn't have even been this close to people. She should have been on the outside of the gate. She should have been hollering, unclean, unclean. But for whatever reason, she's here and she's heard about Jesus. And she says, I need to but touch His garment. I believe she was physically unclean. But according to the priest of the day, I believe she was spiritually unclean. And she knew that she needed to touch Jesus. She had heard of what He can do. Now, I, I've, I've not compared or anything else, but maybe she heard about... Maybe, maybe, maybe it was that she heard about the blind man. Maybe she heard about Jesus turning the water into wine. Maybe she heard about some other miracles that Christ had done. She said, if He can do that, maybe she was somewhere in the crowd uh, in verse number 1 down through verse number 19 and 20. Maybe, maybe she saw, Samuel, what had happened to the man there in Gadara. She heard about Jesus. She knew she needed to touch Him. She knew she couldn't go to the temple. She knew she couldn't worship there. She was unclean. It was forbidden. I can imagine the depression, the worry, the guilt, the shame, all of those things just combined in one that she was dealing with. Those thoughts began to take over. A few months back, I was talking to a man that was in so much pain. I, I want you to listen to this. I, I didn't even say it. Unnatural thoughts most likely began to take over her life. And I was talking to this gentleman, and he began to talk about unnatural things. He began to talk about ending his life. He began to talk about another way out. Folks, pain, suffering, heartache, 
shame, disgrace, whatever it may be. These are things that lend to these unnatural ways of thinking. But can I tell you that even in that, there is hope. It says that she pressed through the crowd and she touched the hem of his garment. And and this is probably not not really essential to know. And and I don't have all the facts, but when I think of a hem, I think of it at the very bottom. I think maybe she was crawling and she was going through the dirt and everything and she touched the hem of his garment. But as I understand it, the, the, the Jewish men wore prayer shawls around them. They had little tassels around them and it was considered not only a symbol of holiness, but for a holy man, it was considered that that shawl itself was holy. And she she reached out through the crowd, maybe maybe through a bunch of other people that she was making unclean, by the way, because she touched them. And she pressed through, Kaylee, and just touched maybe one of the fringes on that prayer shawl, something that was holy. But But listen to this. Listen to this. She needed help, and she needed it that day. She had spent everything to find help. She had wasted years to find some relief. But in verse 29, she found help. As far as the outline, she heard about Jesus. She hurried to find Him. She was healed from her plague, but she was honored by the Lord. And listen to this. Verse number, let's, let's do verse number uh, 30. Verse 29, she was healed of that plague. Verse 30, immediately, knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? Now, hang on just a minute. This word virtue, that is the same word that we get over there in Romans chapter number 1, verse 16. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power, it is the dynamis, or that do it is the dynamite, and Jesus here, or, or, or Mark here, he says that Jesus felt power had gone out of him. When we think of the word virtue, we think of uh, you know just goodness or gentleness, and meekness. But we go a little bit deeper, and we see that he felt power go out from him. But listen to this: he said, "Who touched my clothes?" And his disciples, they, they said, what, what are you talking about? Who touched thee? Verse 32. Uh, and she looked round about, he looked round about to see her what had done this thing. Verse 33. But the woman fearing, this word fearing, it is the word phobeo or phobos or phobia. And it means to put to flight by terrifying. She was absolutely terrified of the conversation that was fixing to happen. She was fixing to be found out. She was in the city. She should have been outside the city. She should have been calling out unclean, but she wasn't. She shouldn't have touched anyone, but she pressed through the crowd. She sure shouldn't have touched a holy man, but here she touched the hem of his garment. She was absolutely about to run again. She was absolutely terrified, but listen... Jesus said, Thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. Throughout her phobia, Brother Jody, throughout that act that absolutely terrified her, instead of cursing her, instead of damning her to some uh, faraway city, instead He said, You are are blessed because of your faith and you are healed. Faith over fear. She was honored by the Lord. I'm going to give you this and I'm going to the house. The daughter of Jairus, number three. I say Jairus. Uh, Brother Preston Cronin that was here a couple months back, he said Jairus. And I searched all through my Bible trying to figure out who Jairus was. But apparently it's the same person. He's just apparently saying it right. How about we meet in the middle and just say, Jairus. He called for the help of Jesus. Verse number 21 down through verse number 24. He he says a few things. There cometh one of the rulers, verse 22. 
When he saw him, when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. Here's a ruler of the synagogue. And he fell at Jesus' feet and besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. He propositioned Jesus. He called him. He says, I need you to come with me. I need you to come to my house. He says, I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed. Notice how dire the situation was. She lieth at the point of death. Over in the Gospel of Luke, Luke recorded the the, the statement as she lay a dying. She was not just sick. She was not just fevered. She had something that no one could help her with. Jesus comforted Jairus in verse 35. We see this woman with this issue of blood all in the middle of all this. You come to verse 35. He just said, thy faith hath made thee whole. Verse 35, while he yet spake, there came came from the ruler of the synagogue's house, certain, which said, thy daughter is dead. Why troublest thou the master any further? And as soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken... He saith unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. Now, Brother Dick, nowhere, nowhere do I see that the words came out of that man's mouth from the house. Nowhere do I see that this ruler of the synagogue began to wring his hands, began to worry and began to cry out, Oh, no, what am I going to do? All of a sudden, we see... Jesus, as soon as he heard the words, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. Can I tell you something tonight? Man, fear will rob you of things that you never thought possible. But it do us all to to be reminded, and myself included, it does all to be doing us all good to be reminded that that as soon as those bad news comes, to remember this phrase: "Be not afraid, only believe." Don't don't be afraid. You got you got bad news in the mailbox waiting for you at the house. Can I tell you, God's already got the answer right here. Before you ever open the envelope, be not afraid. Only believe. You got a doctor's appointment tomorrow. You're scared to death what you're going to find. Be not afraid. Only believe. You may get a phone call that you don't want to have here in just a little while. Be not afraid. Only believe. You say, preacher, it's not as easy as it sounds. I know. I know it's not. And I've not been in any, in in, in near as many of the situations that you have been in. But I have found that the majority of the things that I worry and I fret over never actually happen. And if they do happen, they're not near as bad as I thought they might be. Jesus comforted Jairus. He says, be not afraid, only believe. I'm not going to turn over there, but you can maybe mark it. He uses the exact same phrase in Matthew chapter 14, verse 27. The disciples are out on the on the sea, and they see the Spirit, and they're afraid. And Jesus says, be not afraid, it is I. Jesus condemns the morning, verse 37, down through verse number 40. He said, y'all stay here. Don't come, don't come with me. He said he got to the house in verse 38. He saw the tumult. He says, them that wept and wailed greatly. He said, why you make this ado and weep? The damsel is not dead, but sleepeth. They laughed him to scorn. 
He put them all out, verse number 40. He took the father and the mother of the damsel and them that were with him. They entered where she was lying. I'm just kind of paraphrasing as I'm going through. I hadn't fell off the wagon. Verse 41, he took the damsel by the hand and saith unto her, Talitha Kumai, which is being interpreted, Damsel, I say unto thee, arise. And straightway the damsel arose and walked, for she was the age of the age of twelve years. And they were astonished with great astonishment. And he charged them straightly that no man should know it, and commanded that something should be given her to eat. He said, Damsel or maid, arise. If I can say this without being over dramatic, it might be it might be that that whatever your problem that you're dealing with tonight, it might be bad. It might be the worst thing you've ever been in. But the same hand that reached forth and grabbed this girl by the hand is the same Jesus Christ that has his hand reached out tonight. He just wants to grab all of you. And he may want to say, Jody, arise. Kurt, arise. He commanded this little girl to arise. I love that she she got up, she started to walk. And then he said, go feed her. In our faith over fear, we have to trust the Lord. There's a song, of course you know, trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. You can try your best to trust everything. That's what that woman with the issue of blood did. She, she wasted everything. She, she tried to find doctor after doctor, dollar bill after dollar bill. She wasted it all and there was absolutely nothing left. And she went to Jesus and was healed. It might take everything you've got trying to do it yourself. And God just wants to take you by the hand and lift you up. He might have some words to say to you tonight. You might be like that maniac. He may just want to say, just be gone. I was thinking some time ago about we might have mentioned it some sometime this weekend about Hezekiah getting that letter from Sennacherib. Sennacherib sent sent him a message and he said, "Hey, I'm I'm gonna, I'm gonna tear everything up. I'm gonna kill everybody. I'm gonna run y'all over." Hezekiah took that letter and put it before the Lord, gave it to the Lord, and God took care of his problem. And I realize this may seem silly to some. But you may just have to do something like this. You say, oh, it's just symbolic. You can call it what you want. I don't, I really don't care. You might just have to take a little piece of paper and write fear on it. Or whatever your fear is. Lay it down before God. Your face on the ground and give it to God. And let God take it from there. Every time. If we'll allow it. God wants to do it. So know that I said. If we will allow it. Faith will overcome fear. Every time. 